Joaquin Archivaldo Guzman, the richest, most feared drug lord in the world, dreamed of his name in lights. Hollywood was going to immortalize him. He stood only five feet, six inches tall, but with help from two glamorous movie starlets and an Oscar-winning actor, El Chapo would be bigger than Pablo Escobar, bigger than Scarface. Then, suddenly, the lights went out. And it was Hollywood's rebel with a thousand causes who flicked the switch. If any Hollywood celebrity would get mixed up in a caper like this, it would have to be Sean Penn. It's crazy. January 8, 2016. Mexican Navy Special Forces, Army, and Federal Police converge on a house in northern Sinaloa, Mexico. Inside is the most wanted man in the Western Hemisphere, a man considered to be the wealthiest and most dangerous drug trafficker in the world, a man who's embarrassed the Mexican government by escaping from two of its maximum security prisons. Amid the gunfire, the suspect slips away through a hidden tunnel but he's captured in the street after hijacking a car. A few hours later, the suspect is paraded for the media. Then, he's returned to the prison he'd escaped from six months earlier. Joaquin Archivaldo Guzman, public enemy number one, has come to the end of his last tunnel. And the saga of the murderous drug lord they call El Chapo, seems to finally be over. But not so fast. Within hours of his capture, a bizarre only in Hollywood story would emerge about what transpired while El Chapo was on the run. If his capture had all the elements of an action movie, this story has even more. There's action, all right, along with mystery, drama, intrigue, romance, even comedy. And there's a woman in the picture. In fact, there are two. But the big news is his male co-star, a two-time Oscar winner. As the official story has it, Sean Penn met the fugitive El Chapo for an interview that he hoped would reopen a dialogue about drugs in America. He came away with something very different. Es exclusivo para la señorita Kay del Castillo y el señor Sean Penn. And the story of what really happened behind the scenes, who was involved, and what everyone got from it has never been told until now. It's the kind of story you really couldn't make it up. A Hollywood actor sitting in a five-star hotel gets this idea to go interview a drug lord for a rock and roll magazine, and then the police capture the guy who's on the lam, who escaped from prison by digging a tunnel through his shower. I mean, you really couldn't make this up. El Chapo, or Shorty, because he never grew above five foot six, and Sean Penn, who settled in at five foot eight, lived dramatically different lives. But in some ways, Theirs were parallel lives, and the fact that they'd star together in this real-life tragicomedy was almost predestined. Chapo is a mythological figure in Mexico. He's like Robin Hood. Uh, in Mexico, there are 32 families that own the country, and if you're not born into one of those families, your chances of success are rare or nil. And so he is seen as a folk hero because he was able to break out of his impoverished situation and become a megastar. Sean Penn's a pretty unusual character. I can't speak for middle America, but my guess is, is that he's perceived as somebody who's one of those Hollywood liberals, <laughs> who's a little bit of a loose cannon, who is kind of this rogue guy who's going off and doing kind of crazy things. But um, he, he doesn't care what middle America thinks for sure anyway, so. El Chapo was born into a poor family either on Christmas Day 1954 or in 1957. The records are sketchy in Sinaloa State, Mexico. 
a small town called Latuna. Sean Penn was born in 1960 into a well-to-do showbiz family and raised on Point Doom in exclusive Malibu, California, not far from Tuna Canyon. Sean Penn does come across as this really kind of scrappy, very intense guy. And you would think that he's grown up on the sort of mean streets. But actually, he had a, a pretty lovely childhood. He grew up in kind of paradise, really. He had a loving family. He had two nice brothers. They made home movies together. But he did have this kind of dark side to him, and there were issues there. El Chapo's father was a cattle rancher who farmed opium poppies on the side. Sean Penn's father was an actor and director who was blacklisted in the 1950s. And really, he was something of a war hero during World War II, but he was blacklisted after he wouldn't name names during the Red Scare. After he was blacklisted, he had to turn from acting to directing to make a living. And while Sean Penn got his first TV role at 13, his father cast him in Little House on the Prairie. El Chapo was 15 when he started up his first marijuana plantation. Look, as, as far as I... Uh, People there are concerned is that it's very uppity uh, of America to blame these people that had no other option but to, to sell uh, drugs. The problem with drugs is that the, it, the immense amount of money that it brings uh, corrupts everything from, from, from the corner cop to the president, you know. Yeah, you could do something else, you know, that's, that's an excuse. But I'll tell you, Sinaloa is a, is, is a state in Mexico that that has always been famous for this. Before Chapo, you had Caro Quintero, and before him, you, you had the... Sorry, we were away from this plane, sorry. That's, that's El Chapo. By the early 1980s, Sean Penn's future interview subject, El Chapo, was coordinating shipments for one of Mexico's major drug lords. Sean Penn was making his mark on Hollywood in the movie Fast Times at Ridgemont High. He started out as this very iconic character, as Jeff Spicoli, which is sort of this image of this pothead, idiot guy. 1985 was a game-changing year for both men. The murder of an American DEA agent led to the arrest of the leader of the Guadalajara drug cartel and El Chapo's rise as a drug trafficker. And an encounter with a pop star led to the near downfall of Sean Penn. It was January on a Hollywood soundstage when he met Madonna. She was shooting the video for Material Girl, the song that would define her image. So she was this kind of sexual revolutionary who really thrived on attention and, and drama, really. And he was this kind of Hollywood kid who, you know, had a bit of a chip on his shoulder. And it was an incredibly volatile mix. They were married eight months later, outdoors in Malibu. The wedding took place on her 27th birthday and just a day before his 25th. There was a huge amount of press attention. There were photographers circling in helicopters above, and legend has it that Sean fired off a pistol at one of the helicopters. The marriage ended after four years. But in his time with Madonna, Penn's life and reputation changed drastically. His public image went from intense, brilliant young actor to spoiled, violent Hollywood brat. Sean and Madonna back in the 80s really were the hot couple of Hollywood. They were the kind of Kim and Kanye's or the Brad and Angelina's of the day. They were really were tabloid fodder and people just couldn't get enough of their crazy love story. Madonna really lapped up the attention, but for Sean, he was just too much of a hothead back then to really handle it. He lashed out at the paparazzi. He threw rocks at them. He served jail time after punching someone on set. So it really was a very, very dark time for Sean. By the end of the 80s, the man who'd be Sean Penn's second most controversial partner was running his own Sinaloa cartel, running drugs through 60 tunnels he'd built between Tijuana and San Diego. Meanwhile, Sean Penn was running from his tabloid image. He announced he'd quit acting because he really wanted to direct. He'd really had enough by that point of all of the attention, all of the tabloid headlines, and the whole Hollywood scene. And he realized that he'd just become a bit of a joke. He wanted to be taken seriously. 1993, El Chapo was arrested and sentenced to 20 years for drug trafficking and bribery. That year, Sean returned to acting in Carlito's Way, playing the attorney 
for a drug kingpin. With his shaved forehead and permed hair, he was unrecognizable. And with his next role, the real-life Sean Penn took on some changes as well. His desire to be taken seriously in the real world had led to a new career as a liberal Hollywood activist. He had his wild child period, and he's come through that, and I think he's matured into and channeled that sort of wild child part of him to do really serious issues in his acting, as in Dead Man Walking, which takes on the issue of capital punishment, the death penalty. And he's also matured into his directing roles, and he has, in parallel, become an activist, a social activist. But perhaps nothing affected Sean Penn more than the death of his father, Leo, in 1998. Sean remembered him as a patriot whose country turned against him. And it seems that that's what set Sean off on his own journey to become a revolutionary, to become an activist. And with the new century and administration, Sean Penn's activism was about to take a turn that would culminate in his meeting with El Chapo. In 2001, to the great embarrassment of Mexican authorities, El Chapo bribed some guards and escaped from the maximum security Puerto Grande prison in a cart of dirty laundry. He'd remain on the run for 13 years, picking up folk hero status among Mexico's poor, a Robin Hood helping villages with roads and schools, while his cartel expanded from cocaine and marijuana to heroin, ecstasy, and crystal meth. That year, George W. Bush took office, and Sean Penn began running in a direction that would eventually lead straight into El Chapo's arms, or at least that handshake. With George winning, and then I think the twists and turns of, of political events where suddenly you're, you know, you have 9-11 happen, and then, and then suddenly it's, oh, we're going to Afghanistan, which makes sense, and then suddenly you have this strange pivot where you're going into Iraq, which doesn't make sense. You know, I think Sean saw the folly in the Iraq war long before, you know, mainstream media ever did. With Hollywood supporters cheering him on, Sean Penn would pull so many left-wing political stunts, we could easily forget he had time to pick up two Oscars for Best Actor along the way. He's very involved in matters of social justice and politics. And he also sometimes sees himself as a kind of self-appointed emissary <laughs> of change in certain cases. Shouldn't you guys be out becoming a princess somewhere? It seems that acting's never quite been enough for him. He wants to be a, a revolutionary. He wants to be a real-life hero. I think whether Sean was a, or wasn't an actor, I think he would still be an activist. December 2002, Sean Penn visits Iraq to protest the Bush administration's plan for a military strike. 2003, back to Iraq. 2005, Iran, both times as celebrity reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle. The editor who gave Sean Penn his press credentials was Sharon Stone's ex-husband, Phil Bronstein. So he knew a little something about the whole Hollywood world and the power of celebrity. And even though there was quite a lot of backlash from real journalists who went berserk um, when Sean Penn went to Iraq and Iran, Phil knew that it would get the clicks. And these days in journalism, clicks is really what it's all about. 2007, Penn delivers this memorable message to President Bush at a town hall meeting in Oakland, California. We cower as you point your fingers telling us to support our troops. Well, you and the smarmy pundits in your pocket, those who, those who bathe in the moisture of your soiled and blood-soaked underwear can take that noise and shove it. That same year, Sean Penn meets with Venezuela's president, Hugo Chavez, in Caracas. The Marxist Chavez praises Penn for urging Americans to impeach President Bush. It's this relationship that leads to a public confrontation one that reveals a split, not only among Sean Penn's viewing public, but his colleagues in Hollywood. I compare Chavez to any devil that has been out there or there still is there. When I see him together, I couldn't believe it, and I tried to get a hold of Sean. He never wanted to talk to me. 
we co-starred in Colors and we got along great, great. You know, he's, he's an amazing actor and we never spoke politics. I went to pick up my mother at the LAX and she was coming from Miami and all of a sudden I see him, I see Sean Penn there waiting for the suitcases. I gotta say that I did get a little bit of anxiety and oh my God, oh my God, what do I do? Should I, should I go to him and finally talk to him? Oh my God, you know, because I, I know his temper, especially when our issues that, you know, that like this, about politics where, you know, they destroy people's lives. So I said to him, you know, it must be great to grow up uh, as a communist the way you live. One thing led to the other one. He called me a pig and uh, I called him a communist. No, Sean is far from a Sean is actually one of probably the truly most uh, giving and, 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 and truly charitable and, and truly uh, decent human beings I've ever met in my life. He's far from a I turn around to, to walk towards my mother and he's screaming at me. Everybody there was so quiet. Must have been in shock. People were like, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. And I just turn around and I scream with all my strength, communist And I continue walking and that was it. My mother, she started clapping. 2008, Sean Penn surfaces in Cuba. The Cub reporter interviews President Raul Castro. A communist Right, he's usually on the side of uh, the left in some way, and often, you know, in opposition to whatever the position of the American government might be. And along the way, Sean Penn plays real life action hero. In the wake of Hurricane Katrina, he flies to New Orleans and personally pulls people out of the floodwaters. He brings along two macho accessories, a shotgun and a personal photographer. Critics call it a PR stunt. If it is, the stunt backfires when his dinghy springs a leak. Then there's Haiti. After the 2010 earthquake, Penn wings in to the rescue. He brings in medicine and doctors. Personally runs a camp for thousands of homeless. He moves there, always armed with a Glock pistol in his waistband. 2012 in Pakistan visiting flood-stricken villages. 2013, helps free an American from a Bolivian prison. He's not afraid to go down and, and, and get, get dirty and, 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 and make things happen in the name of helping people. I think anybody that was sitting back, you know, behind a news desk or, or you know, sitting in an air-conditioned room making fun of Sean Penn for going out and helping people, I think those people need to look themselves in the mirror. I think his heart is in the right place and, and, and uh, good for him, you know? He decided to do something social with his uh, fame and, and for that you gotta give him credit. I'm not kissing his ass. I personally, I think his politics is whack, but, but you know, he, he means well. He at least is uh, trying to do something with his fame and, and for that, here, for that I take my hat off to Spicoli. And then comes February 22nd, 2014, the fifth anniversary of the night Sean Penn received his second Oscar for Best Actor. El Chapo, on the run since 2001, is trapped in a beachside condo in Mazatlan, Sinaloa. When the feds bust in, he's naked in bed with his beauty queen wife and an AK-47. He's arrested and taken to the Federal Readaptation Center number one the maximum security prison. He won't be there long. While in hiding, he'd made a new friend, a glamorous pen pal he hopes will make him immortal. And the wheels are about to be set in motion for Sean Penn's greatest and most controversial adventure yet. While El Chapo was on the run for 13 years, he was described by the U.S. Treasury Department as the most powerful and wealthy drug trafficker in the world. Forbes magazine listed his worth at a billion dollars, and the FBI claimed 
he was responsible for 70,000 deaths. El Chapo was a legend throughout Mexico. Cuando escuché por el radio que habían agarrado al Chapo. He was even something of a pop star, subject of many narco corridos, folk songs glorifying his crimes. He even paid to have some written. Es que agarraron al Chapo. But to El Chapo, like many criminal figures before him, he would never be truly legendary until his story played out on the silver screen. Amongst the drug dealers and the gangsters that I work with, El Chapo is somewhat of a folk hero because he stuck it to the man. So I don't think that El Chapo didn't think that he made it, but he's up against many other cartels and he wants to be the number one cartel and the number one drug dealer. And of course he wants a film made about himself. In hiding, he could look to his late Colombian counterpart, Pablo Escobar. For Colombia during that time, when I was very young, for Pablo Escobar, he was somebody to be reckoned with. It, it, it was fear. I think many people were afraid. That kind of reputation, the lawlessness, I think the stereotype of what a Colombian was, that that's exactly what led me to the law. An immigrant is, is not a violent drug lord. An immigrant's not a criminal. Uh, an immigrant, especially Latinos, were not poor and uneducated and heartless human beings. El Chapo moved more drugs and a larger variety to more places in the world than Escobar. But Pablo Escobar had been portrayed in many movies and television shows, including the sprawling Colombian series Escobar El Patron del Mal, and most recently, the Netflix series Narcos. I spoke with a friend of mine who's uh, one of the people whose life rights we had for Narcos, and he's involved with the DEA, and he said El Chapo saw Narcos while on the run. Obviously, these guys have access to computers, and uh, quite honestly, probably had a lot of time on his hands uh, with half the country looking for him. In his mind, El Chapo needed to go Hollywood and do it his way. I don't know if El Chapo wanted to be uh, like Pablo Escobar, but I think they were probably cut from the same cloth. There's no doubt that there's a personality makeup of a cartel leader that certainly is boastful and, and wants attention. But there's another more practical reason for a desire to be represented as a larger-than-life figure in the media, which is this. To run a cartel requires intimidating your rivals. El Chapo doesn't have to do that. Uh, you can take my word for it. There will be many movies uh, uh, done of you uh, when you're no longer with us. Pablo Escobar never worried about, about that. He, and yet, how many? He's on Netflix 24 hours a day. Look, if OJ can get a movie, Chapo can get many movies, you know? <laughs> El Chapo saw his chance when he struck up a friendship with another Mexican drug lord, a beautiful one, a make-believe one on Mexican television. La Reina del Sur is a soap opera about a drug lord's wife who, after his death, decides to follow in his footsteps and take over the family business, and does so. And so this soap opera was very novel for Mexican television because this is a soap opera where a woman was empowered. Drug trafficker Teresa Mendoza was played by a woman named Kate Del Castillo, a veteran Mexican actress on the edge of 40. Kate Del Castillo is a very beautiful, talented actress from Mexico City, and she started off in soap operas, which they call telenovelas. Kate is, I, I would maybe make a comparison to Jane Fonda, because her father, Eric Del Castillo, is a very, very respected, distinguished, leading man actor from both television and film, and so she was Mexico's version of Hollywood royalty, Hanoi Jane Mexico style. Kate had found some success in the States, in films and shows like Jane the Virgin and Showtime's Weeds, playing another crime boss. But her role in La Reina del Sur made her a superstar in Mexico. The character in the Reina del Sur is a ruthless, murderous drug lord because that's just the nature of that business. People liked her character 
and it was a beloved character. She had also something that was very unusual for a Mexican soap opera. She had kind of torrid love affairs. She would have uh, one night stands and things that, you know, in Mexico, at least on their television shows, are just kind of taboo. Hi, I'm Kate Del Castillo for PETA. If you're thinking about going to a circus that uses animals, please reconsider. As a celebrity, Kate had her causes, but nothing like what she announced in 2012, the year after her show premiered. She went to her Twitter feed to announce that she trusted El Chapo more than the Mexican government, and she challenged the real-life fugitive drug lord to traffic in love. Well. Having lived in Hollywood now for over 10 years, it's hard to discern when people are doing things for uh, shock value. So perhaps she saw the moment or seized the moment because of her fame in Mexico to make a statement that would maybe rumple some feathers or, 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 or get people titillated by her comment. Next thing you know, Kate heard from El Chapo's lawyers. El Chapo wanted to send her flowers. Perhaps Chapo Guzman, from watching the show Reina del Sur, or growing up watching her on soap operas, felt that he had some nexus or connection or friendship with her. The virtual relationship blossomed with flirty, sexy texts. We'll drink tequila and champagne. I'll take care of everything so you're comfortable. I will take care of you more than I do my own eyes. I am so moved to hear that you will take care of me. No one has ever taken care of me. Thank you for being such a great person. You are so beautiful in every way. I'm telling you, I feel safe for the first time in my life. My mother wants to meet you. I told her about you. Don't worry, nothing serious. Everything will be great. The Mexican government apparently has something similar to a wiretap law, and they were able to tap the communications of Chapo Guzman with Kate Del Castillo, and therefore Kate's texts were caught in this back and forth between Chapo and Kate. After El Chapo's recapture in 2014, he had a proposal for Kate. Not a wedding proposal, but a business one. He wanted his life made into a movie, a Hollywood movie, and he wanted Kate Del Castillo to set it up and produce it. That's when Kate was suggesting, perhaps to Chapo, that she could put together this dream team of Hollywood it people to put together this biopic film. Meanwhile, the man who'd broken out of prison once before was about to do it again. On July 11, 2015, in El Chapo's cell at the maximum security prison, a hole appeared in the floor of the shower stall. A security camera showed El Chapo stroll casually into the stall and drop out of sight. Talk about Hollywood. El Chapo's team of engineers had spent three months in Germany studying techniques for digging a tunnel, avoiding underground water platforms. The tunnel cost a few million dollars. It had lights, ventilation, and a rail line on which a mounted motorcycle would speed him to a construction site a mile away. Once he was able to escape, Chapo's lawyers uh, sent a text to Kate saying he got out. And she said, yes, I know, I couldn't be happier. The escape didn't put the brakes on the movie plans. Kate found a Hollywood producer and asked him to be her partner on the project. Fernando Sulichin brought in his partner, Jose Ibanez. Both Argentinians who are big time players in Hollywood. They work often with director Oliver Stone. The next step, was setting up a meeting with El Chapo to make things official. And this was where another Mexican actress stepped in. Yolanda Andrade is a famous television personality in Mexico. She's a very beautiful, bubbly, vivacious person, and she has girlfriends. Yolanda is very much out to the public. She has one, if not two, talk shows on Spanish television, and she's also very beloved by Mexico. Not to the level of Kate, but similar. Yolanda's father, Rolando, allegedly had connections to El Chapo's cartel. Reports say that she helped arrange the meeting. Yolanda and Kate are rebels, yes. Uh, perhaps rebels with a cause. Everything was set, 
Kate was ready to present her Hollywood dream team, but there were a couple of complications. For one, Kate represented a tequila brand called Anor, and she was looking for investors. Maybe perhaps she thought that, you know, there would be some way to get him to invest in this business with her. Now, there are texts that the Mexican government has uncovered that talk about, you know, bring your tequila. You could go down to any corner store in Mexico and get a bottle of tequila. So that leads me to believe it could only be the tequila that she was trying to promote to let him taste it or see if there was any interest on his part. And there was an even bigger complication. Sean Penn got word of the meeting and asked to come along. As far as Kate knew, it wasn't a bad idea. He was a Hollywood player who could definitely get her El Chapo movie made. So Sean Penn goes down to Mexico with one agenda. His agenda is, let's see if we can meet this man and get his life rights and perhaps make either a documentary film or, or, or a Hollywood blockbuster. And Kate has that plan as well. But Kate perhaps has a second agenda. And the second agenda is this tequila bottle that she takes with her to this meeting. Now remember, the official story is that Sean Penn flew into the Mexican jungle to write an article for Rolling Stone magazine. But the clues to his ultimate aim may be in that lengthy, windy Rolling Stone piece. Penn writes of his mysterious connections and traveling companions in the El Chapo saga, one he called Espinosa, the owl who flies among falcons, the other El Alto, a big man, worldly and well-connected. Espinoza is Fernando Sulichin, El Alto, Jose Abanez, both Oliver Stone's producers. Word on the boulevard is that Stone was ready to put up $6 million for El Chapo's life rights. Was Sean Penn doing research to play El Chapo in an Oliver Stone film? Oliver Stone refused to comment. October 2nd, 2015, Van Nuys Airport. Sean Penn, Kate Del Castillo, and the Oliver Stone producers fly out in a leased Beechcraft Hawker business jet and set off for what would come to be known as the bungle in the jungle. The private jet carrying Sean Penn, Kate Del Castillo, and the Oliver Stone producers lands at an undisclosed airport in mid-Mexico. Flight records will say it's Guadalajara International. The group is then taken by minivan to a hotel. Penn will write that he's sure the DEA and Mexican government are tracking their movements. He's correct. At the hotel, the group is herded into a convoy of armored SUVs and driven an hour and a half to a smaller dirt airfield. One of the drivers is El Chapo's 29-year-old son, Alfredo. They board two small planes for a two-hour flight into the jungle of Sierra Madre. It's another exhausting 10-hour truck ride before Penn and his group arrive in a jungle clearing. And finally, there before him, the little man himself, El Chapo Guzman. Sean Penn had no idea what he was walking into. There was no way he could know what kind of temperament El Chapo could have, if he's a hothead, if he's been up for four days, if he's using his own product, he's a murderer, he's a drug dealer. He's definitely to be feared. This is the first time El Chapo has met Kate. Penn writes that he greets her like a daughter returning from college. Kate acts as Penn's translator in a seven hour interview without notebook or tape recorder. Penn writes that El Chapo reminds him of Tony Montana, Al Pacino's character in Scarface. Written by Oliver Stone. Let's cut to the chase here. The whole thing is very much through the looking glass. At the end of the day, he sat there with a fugitive drug lord for seven hours or whatever it was and didn't interview him. They sat around and, you know, drank beers and ate tacos. It may not have helped his Rolling Stone article, but I'm sure it helped him as an actor tremendously to see what his mannerisms are like, how he walks, how he talks. The seven hours of somebody, I'm sure, is a great study. When it's time to leave, Penn asks to take a photo. 
to prove the meeting took place. It's his idea not to smile. Sean Penn and El Chapo make plans to meet in eight days for a more formal interview. But the authorities who had been watching make their move. As Penn and Kate wing back to Los Angeles, the Mexican military and DEA begin raids on El Chapo's strongholds in Sinaloa. El Chapo escapes with face and leg wounds. As the world closes in, El Chapo hides out in the coastal town of Los Mochis. He will not make the reunion with Sean Penn, but through text messages to Kate Del Castillo from a satellite phone, he agrees to honor his promise to give Penn an interview. Sort of. This will fall far short of El Chapo and Sean Penn's dreams. Sean Penn will submit questions, which will be translated into Spanish and read to El Chapo by one of his men. El Chapo agrees to respond to the written questions on video. This is the result. <laughs> The video runs 17 minutes. Sean Penn provides the questions he apparently presumes everyone wants to ask the most powerful, wealthiest drug lord in the world, a man with $1 billion responsible for 70,000 deaths. He asks very penetrating things like, What's your attitude toward violence? Really? That's not an interview. It is definitely a scoop. He's definitely a get. But he just gets to choose what he says, and there's no follow-up, and there's no context. Is a pale facsimile of a proper interview. Because Sean wasn't there, they phoned it in. The guy who was asking the questions really was put in a situation where, you know, uh, of, of those questions, if they offend Chapo, or they, 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 he, his life would have been in peril, right? But so you could tell his hesitation as he was asking them in Spanish. Este, ¿Qué diría usted acerca de la violencia? And Chapo would look at him. Let me rephrase that. I would have loved to, you know, to see Sean Penn sit down next to El Chapo and go, "You see my movies, huh? What do you think of uh, Rich Man High and Dead Man Walking?" But maybe not dead man walking, that would have been uh, weird. In this list of questions, which again, is not an interview, really, it's more like back page of the New York Times Magazine, fun Q&A with so-and-so. An interview is when you ask someone a question, they give you an answer, you, you come back again, and then you continue to probe somebody, right, to the degree that you feel is possible and understanding that you are a little bit captive in a captive situation where there's probably armed gunmen all around you to make sure you don't want to be rude, or you don't want to be hostile in any way, but you, at the same time, want to ask a question. That was not what was going on. Sean Penn submits his article to El Chapo for approval. Then he submits it to his editors, and he waits for the world to discover his journalistic triumph. On January 8th, 2016, the military and police descend on El Chapo's hideout. Five of the drug lord's men are killed in the gun battle. But Shorty and one of his henchmen scramble into a tunnel hidden by a mirror. They hide in a sewer for four hours before emerging out a manhole onto a busy street. They hijack a white car at gunpoint. And when the car breaks down in a cloud of smoke, El Chapo hijacks a red SUV. On a busy highway a few miles away, he's surrounded and arrested. The soldiers keep him in a hotel room until the smoke clears. His pretty shirt is gone. The next day, Rolling Stone publishes Sean Penn's article. It admits that El Chapo was given editorial approval, but claims he requested no changes. Reaction is swift and negative. 
This article was 10,000 words long, but it was mainly about Sean Penn. He talked about his genitals, about flatulence, about El Chapo's fashion. It really wasn't a, a journalistic piece as we know it. It's definitely problematic to show an article ahead of publication to the subject of that article and generally speaking, no self-respecting publication will do that. If you know in advance that the subject you're writing about is gonna have approval over the piece before you write it, then there's a good chance you're gonna be more careful and more selective about what you put in the piece. When news breaks, Sean Penn is at a Haiti benefit at a posh Beverly Hills hotel. His date is Madonna. Madonna right here, Madonna. Criticism intensifies in the days to follow, along with an allegation from a U.S. government official that the Rolling Stone article was just a protective cover-up. The source tells Fox News that Penn could have faced criminal charges in the States for trying to make a movie deal with a significant narcotics trafficker. If I put on my lawyer hat for a minute, this could be two people running away from an incident and every man for themselves, And perhaps Sean was advised by his lawyer to say, look man, you better run out and write an article for Rolling Stone about this thing so you can be protected under the First Amendment freedom of the press because the freedom of the press protects interviews like this. But if you don't do this and it was just the movie deal, they may be able to nab you for something. Within days, Penn finds a sympathetic journalist to hear his side. Charlie Rose treats the actor very gently about as gently as Penn was with El Chapo. Penn tells him he considers his big El Chapo approved Rolling Stone article to be a failure. When Sean said it was a failure, I understood exactly what he meant. Everybody was talking about Sean Penn interviewing El Chapo instead of having the more important conversation of how are El Chapos created? In the end, Sean Penn is left licking his wounds in Hollywood, working on his latest directing effort. Mexico's Attorney General has confirmed that Penn was essential in El Chapo's capture. I think Sean Penn didn't get a chance to, as he says, to get to the questions that he really wanted to ask, and I'm curious to know what those were. Kate now claims she was blindsided by Penn's plans for the Rolling Stone article, and that he left her exposed and in danger. She's concerned that the Sinaloa cartel wants to punish her for the El Chapo debacle. And she's under investigation by the Mexican government for her dealings with him. She's living in Los Angeles and resisting Mexican government demands to return to Mexico. And then there's El Chapo, waiting to see if he'll be extradited to a prison in the United States where a third escape would be less likely. In prison, he complains that the barking of guard dogs and a nightlight interfere with his sleep. And for the first time, El Chapo is not allowed conjugal visits.